Hello, my people. Hope we're doing well. This is the last, uh, third and the last um, video for our review of transformations uh, and their graphs. So let's go ahead and look at an example of an exponential function. Um, if we look at, let's say, y is equal to, uh, let's do uh, one half times e to the 2 minus x, um, I don't know, plus ah, 2. We're going with 2s all of a sudden. Uh, here uh, we have, of the six possible transformations, in this one we actually have five, right? And so if we want to make it a little bit clearer for ourselves, we take a negative 1 out of that 2 minus x, and when we do, we're functionally dividing by negative 1, right? Because factorization is a form of division. You're unmultiplying. It's just a form of division where the factors stick around, okay? And so if we take a negative 1 out, uh, we're functionally dividing by negative 1, which is the same as multiplying by negative 1. And when you do that, you flip a difference, right? Think of, the, think of, the, think of 5 minus 2 is 3, and 2 minus 5 is negative 3. So if you flip a difference... You're just getting the negative of it, okay? And to sort of compensate for the flipping of the difference, we pop a negative 1 out here so that we're not changing the value of that particular expression. We're simply changing the way it looks to us. Now, in terms of order of operation, it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it moves to the right 2. We have a y-axis reflection, which is not really a y-axis reflection, but we'll get to that. We have a vertical shrink of one-half. We have an x-axis reflection, and of course, both of these can go, those can, two can go in either order. And then we're going to go up two. Now, those two can go in either order because uh, you can either multiply by negative one and then multiply by one half, or you can multiply by one half and then multiply by negative one. Uh, you can do it in either order. That's what it means to call. That's what it means to call um, multiplication commutative. Okay. Okay. So remember, all exponentials, and I should be doing this in red, but all exponentials go through zero one because everything to the zero power is one. So when we're doing the parent function, that's easy enough. E is about 2.7. Uh, e squared is about, oh gosh, what is it? 7.2, I think, 7.3. And then um, E cubed is 20.1. So it's just a smidge above 20. Uh, and, and it might be a good idea to, to remember those values, um, especially those three values, right? Uh, because when it, comes to, when it comes to that E cubed, sort of that three, e to the third, e cubed is 20.1. Well, that's way off the Cartesian plane. But the moment that you, if you have half, right, in terms of a vertical shrink, uh, you wind up, it winds up being, uh, it winds up being uh, perfectly reasonable for it to then enter into the Cartesian plane uh, if you then, if you have a shrink and then a shift down. You know what was more than 10 units away from the Cartesian plane is now is now within it. Uh, so those three values are probably good ones to remember. Uh, let's go ahead and go point by point. Let's take this sort of what I usually refer to as the hinge point, since it's not really a vertex, but it serves the same purposes for our for our dealing with exponentials. We'll move it to the right too, and then we're going to y-axis reflect it. But remember. The moment that I shift to the right, I am moving not only those points, but I am moving what is the zero, the zero, um, the, basically the value which creates zero. So that's our new zero right here at x is equal to c, uh, and that for this specific one is x is equal to two. So I move it over. You can't reflect zero because zero times a negative is still zero. But it does, it may be on the zero line with respect to the horizontal, the back and forth. It is not zero with respect to my vertical displacement. It is one unit above the x-axis. 
So I'm going to shrink it, then reflect it, and then move it up two units, and boom, there you go. Okay, let's take this one. It's good to know the approximate values, especially when you start shrinking them, okay? Let's move it over two units. And then we're going to reflect it. It just winds up right back on top of where it was. Then I'm going to vertically shrink it. 2.7 becomes 1.35, so a little under one and a half right here. And then we're going to reflect it, so it's a little over negative one and a half right here. And then we're gonna move it up two units. So right about there, okay? Okay, well let's take this value right here. Um, <clears throat> this value right here, we're going to move it to the right too. Then we're going to reflect it. And then it's about 7 point, I think 7.3. It's a little over seven. So when I shrink it, it's gonna be a little over three and a half. Then I'm gonna reflect it and it's gonna be just a little bit below negative three and a half. And then I'm gonna move it up two units, one, two, and boom, okay? Now, <clears throat> um, I've probably done something wrong. No, 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 I haven't done anything wrong. Um, remember that when, uh, basically in the parent function right here, the horizontal asymptote is the axis. The horizontal asymptote, if you do transformations, is always the y is equal to d line. So on our, on our transformed function, we're going to have a, uh, we're going to have a new asymptote right here at y is equal to two, okay? I'm just gonna make it nice and broad so we can all see it. Uh, and let's go ahead and um, what we have is at three e to the third, we have 20.1. So stick with me on this. We're gonna move it to the right two units. So it's at five and roughly 20. Then we're gonna reflect it. It's three units away from the axis. It's gonna to go to negative 120. Then we're going to shrink it. It's gonna be a little over, a little over 10 right here. Then we're going to reflect it. And then we're gonna move it up two units. And lo and behold, that value that was so far off the Cartesian plane is right here, okay? And since we've reflected it twice, we know that it's going to have a shape that comes up to the up to the horizontal axis rather than I mean up to the horizontal asymptote rather than down to the horizontal asymptote. And that actually is our function graph right there. Okay. Uh, our parent, of course, is uh, this reddish pinkish one right here. And this right here is our transform graph. Okay, well, let's go ahead and take a look at a uh, logarithmic function. Um, let's go ahead and do something like log base 2. I think that sounds like a lot more fun than doing natural log. Base e just sometimes gets a little bit tedious. So let's do f of x is equal to, oh, I don't know. Let's go with um, 3 log base 2 of... Uh, let's go 4 minus x, um, I don't know, minus 2, sure, there we go. Okay, well, let's go ahead and factor out the b value so that it's a little more explicit and we can see it. And the b value, of course, is simply the negative 1, which is going to take that 4 minus x and turn it around into x minus 4. Uh, from here, we know that we're going to move to the right four units. We're going to have a y-axis reflection, which, as we've discussed before, is not really a y-axis reflection. It's really an x is equal to c reflection, but that's really kind of long-winded, so we're just going to call it a y-axis reflection just for, just, for, uh, just for the sake of ease. And then I'm going to vertically stretch it by 3, and then I'm going to move it down two units. So let's go ahead and draw the parent, right? Now remember that any time, look at the log base two, so y is equal to log base two of x. When you plug in a one, you're gonna get a zero. When you plug in a two, you're gonna get a one. When you plug in a four, you're gonna get a two, right? Uh, and when you plug in an eight, you're gonna get a three, right? Uh, because log base two of eight is two raised to what power is 8? Answer, 
3. Uh, and this is one half, and this is one fourth, and this is one eighth, and that's kind of how it progresses. Um, none of this should be a surprise. And we have a logarithmic function which looks like that. Now we need to actually take our transformations and apply them to this. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and take this hinge point. Let's move it to the right four units. Now, when I move it to the right four units, I'm moving everything to the right four units. You have this wonderful asymptote right here at uh, x is equal to zero. That asymptote is now going to be at x is equal to four. Everything shifts, right? And so that is your new zero point. And so all horizontal changes in shape are going to happen about the x is equal to four line. So I move it to the right, four units, and then it's one unit away, so when I reflect, it goes to here. Vertically stretch, well, it's on the axis, so it's not going to stretch, but it is going to move down two units. Okay, let's take this point right here. Let's move it over four units. It's two units away from the x is equal to c line, so when I reflect it, it's oddly enough going to go right on top of where it was before. I'm going to vertically stretch it by three. Now, at present, it's one unit away from the x-axis, so to multiply that one by three, and you get three. And then you move down two, and that's just bizarre. It actually winds up right back where it was. Okay, <clears throat> let's go ahead and take this point right here. Let's move it to the right four units. Let's reflect it. Let's stretch it by three, so it's at two, and it becomes six, and let's move it down two units. Okay, let's take this. Let's move it over four. Uh, okay, well, it's off at 12 right now, but it's 8 units away, and so when I reflect it, it goes 8 units this way. I'm going to stretch it by 3, so 3 becomes 9, and then I'm going to move it down 2, and there it is. Okay, uh, I'm going to, it's easier for me to sort of twist it like this in order to sketch it. Okay, and there you go. All righty. Uh, let's go ahead and look at a an example of a reciprocal function. Now, like I was saying in, in uh, class, or for those of you who weren't there in the class video, we don't usually use transformations when we're talking about rational functions because there's such a wide variety of them that you can't possibly enumerate all of the, uh, all of the um, parent functions, right? Uh, and not all of them are capable of being reduced to transformations on particular parent functions. But when we're dealing with, like say, y is equal to one over x, that's a really simple parent function. And there are a lot of rational functions that are transformations on that, okay? Um, let's go ahead and do like y is equal to, um, Let's do negative one over two to the x minus two plus three or something like that, okay? Now, that may not look a whole lot like uh, a reciprocal function, but you know, you can change the form a little bit. And since we don't have a lot of room up there, let's, let's sort of play with the form down here. We have 2x minus 2 plus 3. Well, that could be negative 1 half over x minus 2 plus 3. And that can be transformed into negative 1 half x minus 2 to the negative 1 plus 3, right? Uh, because to stick something in the denominator, uh, you basically is the same thing as raising it to the negative 1 power. Well, if this right here is x to the negative 1, then we can see that this does represent a transformation upon this as a parent function. And those transformations are, and I'm going to rewrite it up here so it's within the, it's within the field of view, uh, plus 3. And so we have it moving to the right, 2. We have an x-axis reflection. We have a vertical shrink of one half, and we're gonna move it up three units. Now, remember, shifts move everything. And so shifts move asymptotes. So that's kind of neat. We know that the original that the original function 
Okay, and let's go ahead and uh, let's let's go ahead and uh, change the scale on this. Uh, let's make uh, one unit two boxes so that the Cartesian plane is no longer negative ten to ten, but negative five to five. I think that's going to help us by opening this up and allowing us to see it a little bit better. Uh, now remember, y is equal to 1 over x is the same thing as xy is equal to 1 when I multiply both sides by x, right? That means that the product is equal to 1. That means they have to be reciprocals or multiplicative inverses of each other. That's why they call this the reciprocal function. And so basically if you have 1, the reciprocal of 1 is 1. But if you have 2, the reciprocal of 2 is 1 half. And at 4, the reciprocal of 4 is 1 fourth. And it goes the other way uh, in a certain sort of symmetry up here. That also happens with the negative numbers, right? The reciprocal of negative 1 is negative 1. The reciprocal of negative 1 fourth is negative 4. Uh, and so I'm going to tilt this a little bit while I... Um, Okay, there is our parent function in all of its glory. Now, we don't actually draw them, but these both of the axes, the x, y, x and the y axis, are actually asymptotes for this reciprocal function. And if we are going to move everything over two units, then this axis this, uh, the y-axis, which was the asymptote, we have a new asymptote, which of course, you know, if you look at it, you recognize that that's just how it goes, right? Uh, now, we also should note that this becomes an asymptote, right? Uh, if you were to actually take that original function and put it back into um, a single expression, you would see the... Uh, you would see this asymptote. Of course, it's it's actually even easier to see in this form right here because as x gets really really big in both directions, this stops this stops determining the value, and all that's left over is three. So uh, you have a new asymptote here in terms of vertical, and you have a new horizontal or end behavior asymptote. And what's going to happen is let's go ahead and go point by point. I know that I need to take all these points and move them over two units. I need to x-axis reflect them. I need to vertically shrink them. And then I need to move them up three units. One, two, three. I'm going to go ahead and take this point right here at one half comma two. And I'm going to move it over two units. Remember when you're shifting and you're shrinking, remember if you've changed your scale, you need to remember that as you do it. So four boxes is over two units. Then I need to x-axis reflect it down to here. I need to vertically shrink it by one half. And then I need to move it up three units. One, two, three. All right, let's go ahead and do this one right here at one fourth four. I need to move it over two units. One, two. I'm going to x-axis reflect it down to here. I'm going to vertically shrink it by one half, and then I'm going to move it up three units. One, two, three. All right, let's take this one right here. All right, let's move it over two units. Let's x-axis reflect it. Let's vertically shrink it, and let's move it up three. One, two, three. And you notice that there's still that sort of symmetry as it, uh, not, I mean, not right as it sort of, tucked up inside right here in this corner. Uh, and what you're going to get also is across this, since there was origin symmetry on the original and this sort of becomes a new origin, uh, we should expect that there would be that sort of symmetry on. And of course, you, you, you'll get this confirmed by doing the points, but um, we're kind of running a little bit long. So I wanted to at least point out the symmetry uh, if not for my convenience, but also for your edification. Uh, and there we go. And that basically we see it having, we see it as a transformation on this original parent right here, even though we never really learned about reciprocal functions as proper parent functions. And the thing is that even if you are given a function that doesn't, that doesn't like even 
define a class and you and you relate it to a function nearby you can still think about those things in terms of transformations and that's the beauty of it um, you after you practice transformations for long enough you're able to actually start seeing the graphs of functions in your mind's eye without ever putting pencil to paper uh, and that allows us to have sort of a visual perspective on the functions that we are entertaining, even if we're not specifically asked to graph them, right? Uh, if, we, if we have a numerical perspective, if we have an analytic or notational perspective, and we also have a pictorial or graphical perspective, then we have, we have greater understanding of a mathematical phenomenon the more perspectives we bring to bear uh, upon it. And that's, that's one of the benefits of knowing how to graph well, okay? Um, I hope this has been helpful. We will dive into um, transformations of sine and cosine graphs tomorrow. Uh, but like I said, I wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page when it came to transformations in general so that that was not a limiting factor when it comes to our understanding of these next couple of days. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, uh, shoot me a message or an email. Bye.